I've done a few videos on the technical aspects of security vulnerabilities and exploits, including uh, both the general aspects as well as specific case studies. I'd like to switch gears here a little bit and talk about the non-technical aspects of vulnerabilities and exploits. And in particular, I want to talk about the economic aspects. Now, if you aren't already familiar with this area, it might come as a maybe a bit of a surprise to you that there are economic factors related to security vulnerabilities and exploits. However, if you think about it, a vulnerability is basically just a security weakness in a system. And an exploit represents some type of tangible way, as tangible as let's say code can be, to take advantage of a security vulnerability. And so vulnerabilities and exploits are essentially just really, if you think about it, they're just goods and services. And whenever you have any type of good and service, uh, in general, you can imagine that a market will form around that good or service. Um, even though in this particular case, it's not, let's say, a tangible good the way a physical good might be, you can still have a market that can be formed around uh, this good or service. So throughout the rest of this video, I'll talk about that market and introduce some of the players, some of the nomenclature. I'll start discussing uh, what the considerations are around that market. And then most likely I'll have to do a second video. And in the second video, I'll talk maybe about some of the nuances and some of the details regarding the vulnerability and exploit market. And I do want to stress here that there are deeper ethical considerations around the vulnerability and exploit markets. And my intention here is to more uh, broadly describe these considerations, but not actually go into or dive into any specific position related to the ethical aspects. So with that, let's start with the actual players who are involved uh, in these markets. Uh, so in general, if you have a market, you have to have both uh, sellers uh, as well as buyers. And sellers, if you know in economic terms, typically represent uh, the supply side of the market. And buyers represent what's known as the demand side of a market. And you need both uh, sellers and buyers, you need both the supply side and the demand side for there to be any type of market. Now on the supply side, who exists? Well, uh, typically on the supply side, you have people who find vulnerabilities and develop exploit code for those vulnerabilities. And these people can be um, individuals, for example, uh, and individuals might represent uh, security researchers, people who are interested in finding uh, vulnerabilities. They may be loan guns, uh, people of that nature, maybe people who have specific expertise in, let's say, a particular operating system or in a particular software application. Maybe they know a lot about Flash or about Java, something of that sort. Uh, in addition to individuals, you may also have organizations. And they kind of function the same way. Organizations basically might comprise uh, a set or maybe one or more uh, security researchers who collectively maybe comprise teams to find uh, vulnerabilities. Now this type of work, as you might imagine, is time consuming, it requires a specialized set of advanced skills, and that raises the question of what these organizations might get in return for their efforts. And so for that, I think it helps to understand who the players are on the demand side of the house, who are the, the buyers in this case. Well, to start off with, uh, there are well-known companies who might be uh, buyers, and these might be companies who uh, sell products that could be compromised. So for example, a browser manufacturer or a social networking site, something of that nature. Uh, and these companies might be interested in buying vulnerabilities or paying for vulnerabilities associated with products that they offer. So for example, uh, maybe Microsoft might be interested in vulnerabilities associated with Internet Explorer. And the hope might be that by learning about these vulnerabilities, organizations can then patch their products, they can improve security. And obviously this type of endeavor of being able to improve security is of value to them and they may be willing to compensate researchers for finding security flaws. And this model actually has evolved over time. Uh, for example, in the early days of this sort of thing, the reward, the compensation typically was an award of some type, maybe a public thanks. And researchers, to be honest, might have been satisfied with getting maybe a little bit of fame out of it and perhaps hoping that they could use that fame, maybe parlayed into building up their resume, they may be able to take that, that little extra fame they got and, and hope that that leads to a more lucrative job opportunity down the line and that sort of thing. But nowadays, companies have actually upped the ante a little bit and a lot of them have, for example, um, bounty programs where uh, they'll pay 
uh, researchers a bounty, a bug bounty of some sort for any uh, interesting vulnerability that that researcher can come up with. Uh, these are typically modest cash prizes. Companies may also run contests where they may have uh, many researchers kind of pit it up against each other and they'll award the researcher who comes up with the first vulnerability or maybe the best vulnerability with some type of a, a lucrative cash prize for that effort. And again, the premise is that by hiring or really having smart researchers poke holes in their products, they can then learn more about weaknesses and then shore these weaknesses up. And in this case, the secure researcher might be compensated by an organization and typically the amount to which they're compensated can vary, but it could be uh, you know, for, for maybe a, a simple bug bounty, it might be in the hundreds of dollars. Uh, for uh, some of the more complex situations, they may get uh, thousands of dollars. And uh, in, for contests, it may be even in the, in the tens of thousands of dollars. So, you know, this starts adding up and it starts becoming a decent amount of money uh, quite quickly. Now, the bigger payouts in this case might come, for example, from winning a contest. Or you, you can also imagine that organizations might even be willing to uh, pay directly for a vulnerability. They may just want to work directly with the researcher and even outside of a bounty or contest may actually just uh, be interested in directly uh, purchasing data around vulnerabilities. So moving down the line, uh, the next interesting category of people who might be in the, the buy or demand side of the house uh, might be nation states or, or really well-funded organizations. So I, by nation states, I don't literally mean a nation state necessarily, but I mean uh, an organization that's very, very, very well-funded. Uh, and they may be willing, for example, to purchase exploits for vulnerabilities so they can use them offensively. And for example, uh, that might be something uh, of, a, of a cyber weapon is an offensive use of a, uh, of a security vulnerability. And uh, in this particular case, what might happen is they may, uh, for example, take that exploit and then use that exploit within a piece of malware in order to get that malware onto a victim system. And one particular case study in this regard um, if you might might be aware of is something known as the flame malware and actually I did a series of videos on the flame malware and I would encourage you to watch those and in particular the flame malware exploited two vulnerabilities in uh, Microsoft uh, in particular I think it was MS 1061 and also MS 1046 uh, and when actually when it was discovered there was actually a, uh, another uh, very very well-known piece of of malware called Stuxnet, and Stuxnet is believed to have been uh, created by the same organization, maybe it was done as a parallel effort uh, with Flame, and there is a little bit of overlap in terms of how Flame was developed and how Stuxnet was developed. And Stuxnet actually contained, at the time that it was discovered, four brand new vulnerabilities, and two of them were the ones I just mentioned that are in Flame, uh, and the other two were different vulnerabilities, but the, the upshot is that uh, all these vulnerabilities were basically used uh, within Stuxnet, and, and more so, these vulnerabilities were brand new at the time they were discovered. They were zero-day vulnerabilities. Although the details behind the development of Stuxnet and Flame have not been publicly confirmed, it is within the realm of possibility that the vulnerabilities being exploited were purchased through these markets from other researchers or from organizations, although it certainly is still possible that they were developed in-house as well. Now, for some of the more sophisticated vulnerabilities, especially those that may be used in an offensive context, the cost can literally skyrocket. It can literally be not just in the hundreds of dollars, but in the hundreds of thousands of dollars for a, a good vulnerability. And that's because, uh, as you can imagine, somebody using a vulnerability in an offensive context might derive more value out of that vulnerability than, let's say, a company might derive by simply using it to improve the security of their products. And so well-funded organizations may be willing to pay a lot more money for those vulnerabilities. Now in between uh, nation states and really companies, uh, another category of people who might be interested on the buy side uh, would be, uh, let's say, organized organized uh, cyber criminal groups, okay? And, and uh, here we're just talking really about people who may be um, a little less uh, well-funded compared to nation states, but perhaps willing to expend a bit more money than an individual company might because, again, organized cyber criminal groups might be interested in using vulnerabilities for offensive purposes, for example, for things like uh, cyber espionage or to steal data from a high-value target, even though they may not necessarily have the same uh, level of resourcing to expand as, let's say, a nation state does. So 
hopefully this video gives you an initial picture and I'll stop this video right here. In the next video, I'll fill in a lot more details related to the vulnerability and exploit markets and I'll talk about the ramifications of such markets.